Hi, everyone. So my name is Ashley Wilson, founder of Rewritten, and today we have a special guest, Shelby Rush. We've already been discussing um, before this, this uh, recording and meeting prior to, and I just love her, and I know you're going to <laughs> as well. <laughs> So Shelby, can you talk to us about your background, um, your program that you are blessing our community with, and then we'll we'll get into this discussion about prevention as we as we move along here. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I'm so excited. Um, so basically, right now I am working with the Tioga County Partnership for Community Health, and we are trying to get after school programming happening. We're right now we're partnering with the elementary schools in the valley. So that would be Westfield Elementary, Clarkwood, and then also RB Walter. And starting in January, we launch on January 17th. So coming up really fast, um, which is exciting. So we launched then and Basically, our goal is to have after school programming available Monday to Thursday. And then right now we are identifying 30 kids at each site. Those referrals are coming to us from the school. And the great thing about the collaboration that we have right now is for the school's part, they're going to be providing a tutor. So they'll actually be paying two teachers at each site. And then they're also going to be providing um, like a late bus for us because obviously living in a rural community, transportation is always a huge, huge issue. So we are very lucky to have them as a partner. And they're actually, that's part of um, how they're using their ESSER grant funding is kind of some ways to support kids after COVID. This is part of how they're using their funds. So we're really grateful for their partnership and kind of our part here at the partnership. And what my job is, is I'm networking in the community to try to find individual community members or outside community groups to come in and do some programming with kids. And we can kind of get into if you want kind of what my background is as far as working with kids at some point, but that's what we're doing. Nice. That is, um, it sounds like a, a big undertaking, but at the same time, um, something that is really needed. Mm -hmm. And so my, I think that what would be helpful is like, take people into how you even wanted to start something like this. Like, what, what was your thought process to even get something like this together? Sure. Yeah. So my background is before I just started here in October, um, but really where the idea came for for me is in the last six years previous to this, I have been supervising a program. It's called the ACE program, um, which is run through the county. We would get referrals through the child welfare system. So kids that would be referred to us had to have some kind of case open. Um, with the county. And I love that program. I loved my kids in that program. Uh, it was technically behavior mod program is kind of what we would term it. But a lot of it is about relationship building, right? Like um, kids that have difficult things going on in their lives, kids in general, people in general, we are just like social creatures. We need relationships. We need connections. It's part of how we feel safe in the world. It's part of how we feel secure. And especially when we have difficult things happening in our lives, which we do, because that's just part of being a human being, that security becomes really, really important. And so I was lucky enough to get to work with that program. I supervised it for the last five years and have worked with, I honestly, I, I think I counted it up at one point in time. It was a couple hundred kids in my like career of working um, with Sam is the company, but running running the ACE program. And I love my kids there, uh, getting to build those relationships. I always said that the kids were magical because I just think that they were, and that doesn't mean that they didn't have difficult days, but getting to know them, getting to like hold their personhoods and know their stories and be part of that was something that was incredibly transformative, I would say for me, and just really valuable. I feel like I, they taught me way more, you know, about being a human person than I could probably teach them. Um, but from my love and care for those kids, I did see that there were gaps in our community. And some of that is the difficulty, I think, of living in a rural community that really does pose some really specific barriers to wellness that is different than in other places. So for kids specifically in kind of like the Valley area or over in Liberty, you know, Wellsboro kind of has like a parks and rec system that's active. In Mansfield, you have um, the Y over there, the YMCA. But in those outlying communities, there's, there's not as many hubs that are kind of active. So what I found is kids would come to our program 
and then they would end up not being able to stay in our program because you only qualify for as long as you have the case open and that's all because of funding and all of that good stuff. Um, but then they would lose access to those relationships that they had built for us. And so I would worry about like what happens for my kids once they're done with this program, like where are the outside community supports, right? Parents and families are doing the best job that they can, but it takes a community, right, to care for a child. It really just can't be even just a nuclear family system. So how are we getting caring adults around kids in a regular way? So that was kind of where the idea came from for me is I just saw a gap about, I don't know who are the people outside of teachers, but teachers have so much to do and so many responsibilities already. How do we get just caring people around kids? And part of that too is I just very much believe in the power of the everyday person and every person's ability to have a really positive impact on their community. We think we're living in this like really weird time where there's so much content being thrown at us about what's happening in the world, but outlets to do something about it are sometimes hard to find. So we wanted to try to find ways to make it a manageable volunteering opportunity. So as far as like what it would look like for an individual to come in and run run a program for us, it would be one day a week from four to five. So just for an hour and you just do that for eight weeks. So you would come, we'll provide you with the space, we'll provide you with the kids, we'll help you come up with a program that can be based off of anything because kids just love connection, right? So they don't actually care what they're doing. You can play board games, you can take them hiking, you can do anything with them. Um, you could do arts, crafts, you can run volleyball, basketball, like it does not matter what you're doing. You come for an hour once a week for eight weeks and it will really have a really big impact on their world. And it's also hopefully a more manageable way for people to like get involved and again, take some of that power back over like, this is our community. And its health is our responsibility is kind of, you know, my belief system, at least. So trying to find opportunities for people to engage in that way. That's something that I'm passionate about. And that very much came from my work with kids before. And just to clarify, what are the age ranges? You may have mentioned this before. I just wanted to catch the age ranges um, that you're usually working with within this program. And then did you yeah. say that it's Monday through Friday? Monday to Thursday is Thursday. what okay. it is. Yep, mm -hmm. Monday to Thursday. And the age range technically is K through six. So each school is kind of handling it a little bit differently. So like RB Walter has more littles than the other two. Um, the other schools are really kind of trying to focus on third to sixth grade, but technically we will take K through six. And again, that's 30 that are identified through the school. And that's not necessarily just kids that are like struggling academically. It could be kids that just need some like relational support, or it may be just like parents need some support because they don't have other care for their kiddos after school. So there's a variety of reasons that the kids could be referred. Great. I, I, I like that you said um, that there is so much that's thrown out a, a lot of times about the problem that it makes people overwhelmed sometimes with mm -hmm. the solution. Like, so even given the simplest of this is step one, you can just start with this. Um, mm -hmm. It's so helpful in any type of advocacy work, mm -hmm. just putting that out there for any other advocates that can be that may be listening to this right mm -hmm. now um as mm -hmm. we throw out um issues that are going on with whatever um population we work with or whatever to be able mm -hmm. to give people a step forward in one at least one solution one thing that they can participate in really really is helpful so yeah, i'm thankful that you're doing that yeah absolutely yeah i really think that as far as trying to find ways to get people involved, we are living in such a like fast paced time, like people are overwhelmed and that's totally, totally fair. And I think those of us who are really trying to look at community issues, they're very complex. They're really complicated. You look at something like community safety, right? As a social issue, there's a lot of nuanced things that go with that. And I think sometimes we make the mistake of thinking that complex problems always require complex solutions, sometimes it's really simple, right? One really solid way always to make a community safer for kids 
is just get more caring grownups around who will get to know them as people and who will see them and who will hear them and who will listen to them and automatically your community becomes safer. So I think sometimes we make the mistake of thinking and getting overwhelmed, right, by how complex an issue is. Sometimes the solutions to make a really big impact can be really simple. Yes. Yes to all of that. Um, that's a good segue into just sharing um, with Rewritten, when we're thinking about solution, I that really um, hits a nerve for me because mm -hmm. it really was scaling back. Like when you're getting ready to get into work like this, you're like, oh my gosh, I got to do it this way. I have to do it that way. And I mm -hmm. think one of um, the most helpful things that I had um, was from one of my one of my mentors, Rebecca Bender. She did this two week um, training, and mm -hmm. it brought people in from all parts of the of the field, and they were able to to take that weight off and say it doesn't have to be how you've always seen it. It could look like this. It could look like that. And they started to give out all these different ideas, and now they're like now have it go to the community that you live in. We're in a rural community and I'm sure Shelby, you see this as well. The things that you probably could do in, in a more urban area, you have to tailor it totally different to a rural area. Totally. And, um, you know, when you are planning and you're pioneering new ideas, sometimes you start out with the idea of like, man, this looks like it could just work for everyone. And then the more you get to be involved in your own community and start to really look at those gaps you're like okay I have to scale this down to what works here or not scale it down in a way of like it's not going to make a big impact but I have to mm -hmm. make it I may have to make it impactful for the community that I'm working with I have to make mm -hmm. it um yeah and and that I so I love that we share that in common and, and looking at mm -hmm. that because that has that has really played a, a large part in the changes of directions we have gone as an organization and the more you grow the more you learn the more you uh pivot and structure mm -hmm. your organization to meet your population a lot better oh and so yeah. we found that as well that's one thing that I really love about rewritten and kind of watching the trajectory over that at time you know you and I got together a couple of weeks ago and and yeah. talked a little bit more in depth about that and I had heard about what was happening with rewritten whenever it had first started and you guys yeah. really have made some pivots and just as someone that has worked in a big public system right so you think about like education you think about healthcare you think about social services big public systems do the best they can to meet the needs of a huge group of people, but there has to be room always to like make shifts if we're going to do it well. Yeah. And I think that that's actually the power of doing things through nonprofits and through more of grassroots mechanisms is there is the ability to make those shifts and pivots more easily because there's not as much infrastructure to try to get around, right? In those big public systems, change takes a lot of time. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I've loved to see about Rewritten over time is watching you guys pivot as you have learned more and are able to like solidify, okay, this is actually the strategy that's going to work here and for us and for our community. Um, I think that's a really beautiful thing. And that's certainly going to be the same for us as well. Like we're just launching this, but we will learn so much, I'm sure over the next year, and it will change the way that we approach things because it has to, if we're going to do a good job. But I love that you guys are, I think, a leader in that way and that you've been willing to do that in your own organization. It's hard to do, you know? You kind of have a vision. You want to go in that direction. And when you get that new information, sometimes it's hard to be like, oh, but we just, we just did all that stuff, but you got to pivot. You got to pivot. So I very much respect that. That's how you guys have approached that. I really appreciate that because I, I said one time in, in one of our presentations, um, when talking about our organization, I was like, if change is an issue for you, we're probably not the organization you want to work with <laughs> sure. right, um, right. In, in the most respectful way, just because mm -hmm. um, I feel like to change and even, even for people that are pouring into us, whether, you know, it be financially or time or whatever, mm -hmm. to, to know that we're really listening in and we have a faith component too. So I'm, I'm always, as a leader, always praying about direction and, and, and what, you know, mm -hmm doing all of this anyone you know mm -hmm. who has 
kids and anything else. I mean, trying to raise three little people in this world <laughs> alone is a whole lot of work, let alone yeah. take on a whole organization. So 100%. Yeah, I need a whole other higher power to help. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, there's that component, but um, to, to listen in and to listen in to the, the people that have been drawn to our organization that really fit with the vision and the mission that we're moving forward and to hear their feedback and, and to, um, to again, see where we're at, see what, what's it really the next move that we really should be in it and be able to do that um, well. I think, like you said, you know, it, it speaks to, to um, I hope to validate even donors or people who are pouring into us that we're just not gonna do something just because it looks good, you know? <laughs> does it does it actually work? Is there actually impact exactly. on that? So mm -hmm. to, uh, and so that's awesome that, you know, you have the same thoughts concerning your organization as well. Mm -hmm. What do you think is um, so important about getting on the side of prevention? You know, mm -hmm. we do have the part of people that are already in crisis, you need to help there, but there's this whole other population that we have to help or that can really benefit from prevention. So any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on that. So, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> so again, you know, in my, in my previous experience, I've worked kind of as a provider for child welfare system and, and they're in a difficult spot. Like that system is really made to deal with crises like as they have happened. Right. And um, that's a really important job, but I think sometimes we we don't always have enough services to try to prevent those things from happening, right? It's wonderful. And frankly, we need more services to help people after they have found themselves in a situation where they're in a really difficult spot. But ideally, right, especially for like little people, we want to try to keep those things from happening so they don't have to do all of the work that it takes to unpack those difficult situations, right? Life is just hard. It's just a hard thing. If you're a human being in the world, and especially if you're a paying attention human being in the world, you probably have experienced some trauma in your life. That's like part of the deal, right? Um, but especially when it comes to kids, the impacts of that trauma, like, um, you know, there's ACE scores. I don't know if you're familiar with those at all. Okay, so just to kind of give like a brief overview in case anyone's watching that is not aware, A scores is from a study that was done back in the 1980s. If you want to learn more about them, Nadine Burke Harris has a fantastic TED talk. You should check it out. Um, but basically what they have found is we have tons and tons of data at this point that based off of just a very simple 10 question survey about the experiences you've had as a child, they can very accurately predict long-term health outcomes, things like heart disease, heart attack, stroke, diabetes. And that's based off of 10 questions like, have you experienced physical or emotional neglect? Have you had a parent that was incarcerated, parents that were divorced, all of these things. And based off of those scores, they can really predict like some of the health outcomes of your life. That's some pretty scary data. The beautiful and amazing thing about that though, too, is the way that you mitigate the impacts of that is some pretty simple stuff. One of the most important protective capacities that we can offer that actually lowers the chances of those health outcomes is by providing connection, consistent connection and relationships is a protective capacity. So all that's to say is like, relationships are the answer if something traumatic has happened in our lives, always, but it's also the answer as to how we hopefully help people before they are in a situation where now they have to deal with the fallout of that. And we just have to know that um, the impact of those kinds of situations on us grownups is big, right? But children's worlds are still so small that when those same situations happen in their world, the quake of that earthquake, right? It reverberates in a much bigger way just because their world is so much smaller. So I feel very passionate about especially prevention for children because the impact of those same kind of situations is just so much bigger in the world. And then the fallout of that in the long term is also more significant because of that. Yes, very important. I I just um posted not the um posted an article the other day that shared about um, this project. I think it's called the Compassion Prison Project. But um, mm. 
this woman, she's been doing this for three years now, going into the prisons um, mm -hmm. and trying to help the inmates understand the trauma that they went through. Yeah. And seeing that majority of it happen as a child mm -hmm. and helping them to identify that, okay, you know, obviously you're not justifying their actions, but you're showing you did X, Y, and Z because this and this was lacking or you experienced mm -hmm. this. And then you get to hear the inmates talk and inmates are like, I never heard my mom say, I love you ever, or mm -hmm. the sexual trauma that they've been through. Or mm -hmm. you know, so Shelby, to your point, all the prevention that you do with children mm -hmm. has a big effect on adulthood. And, mm -hmm. um, and where we're on the other end, a lot of times dealing right. with, adults and us um you know yes they're, they're, there's the survivor impact as far as working mm -hmm. with any human trafficking survivors but we have this trauma-informed aspect that really can benefit anyone and mm -hmm. there's so many adults walking around with um re really in trauma that they're mm -hmm. that they don't haven't identified with yet because you know sometimes you've walked around with pain so long that you don't even look at it as traumatic anymore and 100%. so you know you're wanting more safe people to work with the little people mm -hmm. and anyone listening please as older bigger people adults help us you know to to you know like we need to realize the trauma that has affected us so, so we can be healthier mm -hmm. to serve this population well Mm -hmm. The healthier that we get as an adult adds to the safer adults that are there to be able to pour into the young people. So there's this whole cycle here that's happening. So I don't know 100%. if you want to speak to any of that. Yeah, I would just say from like a personal experience, you know, the reason that I have such a passion and why I know that I know that this works. I know that like just having a caring relationship with an adult has a really big impact on the trajectory of a person. Um, part of the reason that I'm so passionate about that is actually when I worked at the um, at my previous job at the agency and I was learning about ACE scores and the impacts of like adverse, it's called adverse childhood experiences is what it stands for. When I was learning about that, I was thinking about relationships that I had in my own family unit as a child. And I'm ticking the boxes on some of those relationships that I've really struggled with. Um, and one of those persons, a score was an eight out of 10. And that was like a very formative relationship. And suddenly when I understood that aspect of that person, it very much changed how I understood why they were unable to relate to me in the ways that I needed them to as a kid. And it very much changed how I understood that relationship. Um, but it also very much changed how I kind of understood myself in the narrative of that relationship, if that makes sense. Um, I was lucky enough that the person that was very much kind of my person that um, I think helped me understand my own potential in the world and to make choices that would set me on a path that would be meaningful and healthy for me it was no one in my family. It was actually my best friend in high school. It was his mom and she didn't do anything radical. You know, she just was delighted. Every time I walked in the door, her love was very sincere. Her care was very sincere and I could feel it all over me. You know, um, she would just listen. She would offer empathy and she just genuinely cared about me. And that was very much enough to impact how I understood myself in the world, how I saw myself reflected in the world. And what I thought about in that room while I'm sitting in this training, I'm just having this like, you know, my whole life unpacked before me. But what I thought about is I know that that family member that I was thinking of didn't have that. They didn't have a caring adult grown up who noticed what was happening with them. And I started thinking about what would have happened. So my person's name that had such a big impact on me, her name is Lucy. I started thinking about what if that person had had a Lucy, how would that have changed the trajectory of how they were able to show up in the world? How would that have changed the relationship that they were able to have with me? How would my life have been different if I'd been able to have that kind of relationship with them? And so I just know that this stuff works because I had that one person, just that one paying attention grown up 
who wasn't a professional. It wasn't a counselor. It wasn't my teacher. It wasn't anything like that. It was just my best friend's mom. And that, that relationship very much changed where I headed and like who I became. So I just know that when it comes to prevention, again, it seems like such a complicated thing, but sometimes it's really not. It's just the, the simplicity and the power of genuine connection. Love that because being genuine and, and authentic changes a whole lot, you know, mm-hmm. as, whether it's an adult to another adult or adult to a child. And I know, mm-hmm. you know, you're, like you were sharing your, your person with Lucy and, and a lot of my teachers growing up were that for me, just mm-hmm. you know, amazing. And one of my guidance counselors, like I can run in there at any point with whatever mm-hmm. and she's there, you know. Um, mm-hmm. I still remember her name today, Nicole Wright. And I was like, I wish mm-hmm. I could find her. I need to look on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. But uh, hey, if you're ever watching, I appreciate it. <laughs> Nicole, <laughs> if you're out there, phone us in. Call us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, so so I, I love that, having genuine and authentic relationship. And especially any of us who have gone through trauma, we can tell when it's not. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so So please don't. Yeah, yeah. we know together. we can sniff that out immediately yeah yeah 100 yeah. with your real self yeah. um, <laughs> and uh so yeah so as we start to wrap up this conversation um what is something that you would leave this audience with concerning just e- whether it be personal care for their own trauma prevention yeah. in another way what what would be your lasting thing that you would share with everyone Um, I guess I would say just, you know, we're kind of hitting on some, some themes of trauma here. I really do think that at this point in time, especially like after in, I guess in the era that we're living in, right. The likelihood that you are a person, if you are anyone watching this, that you've experienced trauma is like high, right. It's okay. If that has happened, it's okay. If you have experienced trauma and not as in that, it's okay that it happened to you but it's okay that that is an experience that you carry. And it is okay if that is um, an experience that you struggle to carry. I think that trauma, the way that I define trauma is when something has happened that people are not supposed to be able to carry. And so there's a transition space between the thing that has happened and the time when we have the skills and the ability to be able to hold that thing. And so if you're in that in-between space, where it just feels like you can't hold the thing. Know that in time and with skills and resources, you will learn how to hold that thing. And that's okay. Um, I guess I just would also say in general for people, I think that it is time. I think that we're living in a unique time where we can start to take some of our power back over our community. Um, I think it's just become apparent no matter where you fall on politics and faith and all of those things. um, There are cracks in our society and we have put a lot of our power in um, systems and people that have a lot of power. And I think it's time for us to say, you know what, this is my community. I have the ability to impact it. This is my responsibility. These are my people. And I want to make sure that the people that I live around have the resources that they need to live whole and healthy and connected lives. And that doesn't take professional qualifications or degrees. Being a caring person who is paying attention and living with intention, I think is actually the most powerful thing that any of us can do. And I think about people like Eleanor Roosevelt. She's like one of my personal role models. Um, You know, she was just a normal person in a way, right? She didn't actually have like a lot of degrees, but she did all of these amazing things because she just was paying attention and she was intentional. And every one of us has the ability to do that. So if you are a paying attention person who is looking for the opportunity to do something intentional with your time, I promise I won't take your time forever, but just for one hour, once a week for eight weeks, if you want to come and have a meaningful experience and have a big impact on kids, we would love, love, love to have anyone that wants to be a part of that. Because I very much believe our community is our responsibility, our kids all of the kids in our county, they are all of our kids. They are all of our responsibility and they need us, especially right now. Um, so if you're looking for a resource to support those kiddos, we really want to work with you. 
That is awesome. Thank you for sharing that. And mm -hmm. um, we here at Rewritten, we look forward to working with you as well. Mm -hmm. and so on that note, thank you so much for coming today. Really, really appreciated. And for those that are watching, um, I hope that you took a lot from this discussion today. Um, if there's anything that you need to sort out um, at Rewritten, we do have a partnership that we work with called Impact. Um, not, excuse me, impact, uh, in hope impact, sorry, <laughs> hope impact. And, um, you guys may have seen her before. Her name is Camilla. Um, if you look on our YouTube page, she's within there. She's come and do, done our, um, trauma trainings as well. And she is amazing and she's willing to connect with, um, people within our community that may need help going through their own trauma and, she's she's top notch she's amazing so if you need that resource please reach out to us and we can get that to you and thank you again shelby have a great day hey thanks ashley